free pantry and learning to bake allergen free. She is here to talk about Beyond the Basics, creating pantry solutions without milk, eggs, nuts, wheat, and soy. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its educational outreach program. I'm Allison Insaro, Senior Manager of Community Services at Kids with Food Allergies, part of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Linda Mitchell, Senior Vice President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, is working behind the scenes today, same as she did in the March Nutrition webinar, if you were with us then. Our webinar guest presenters do so as volunteers without compensation, based on clinical evidence. On behalf of AFA and KFA, we are grateful to Colette for making the time to be here today. There are just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First of all, today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship from Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Mylan for the financial support that enables us to develop educational programs for families. Next, please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical advice or legal advice. You should consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek with regard to food allergies and any other medical conditions. Today's webinar is being recorded. Before we end today, we will have three giveaways from Libre National, Sun Butter, and Pasha Chocolate. We will choose winners randomly from those still in attendance later in the webinar. When we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us as we will take your feedback very seriously to help improve the future direction of our webinar series. Now I'd like to introduce Colette Martin. Colette is a cookbook author, food allergy advocate, and an expert in food allergy recipe development and substitutions. She is the author and photographer of the highly acclaimed Learning to Bake Allergen Free, a crash course for busy parents on baking without wheat, gluten, dairy, eggs, soy, or nuts, and the Allergen Free Pantry. Make your own staples, snacks, and more without wheat, gluten, dairy, eggs, soy, or nuts. Having first learned to bake in her grandmother's kitchen with wheat, butter, milk, eggs, and eggs, Colette understands firsthand what it means to transform a kitchen to, under, to accommodate multiple food allergies. When her son was diagnosed with multiple food allergies, she had to reinvent how her family ate. While his diagnosis of esophagitis, esophagitis triggered by allergies to wheat, milk, eggs, soy, and peanuts ended a 10-year struggle to understand his illness, it was the beginning of learning how to bake and cook allergen-free. Colette served as Vice Chair of the Board for Kids with Food Allergies Foundation from 2012 to 2014. Today, she serves as an advisory board member of Kids with Food Allergies, now a division of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and she shares solutions for busy families with multiple food allergies at her blog, Learning to Eat Allergy-Free. Thank you for joining us today, Colette. Are you ready to get started? Sure am. Okay, great. So why don't you jump Terrific. on it? Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, so po five or more, 50% of the audience has five or more allergies they're avoiding. So, so does my family. Okay, next question. Um, oh, and quite a few of you have been managing food allergies for a really long time, too, but also almost 20% uh, less than a year. So welcome to everybody who's new. Okay, this one doesn't surprise me. Which foods are you most concerned about? Um, which, what are you most concerned about when it comes to food? And 30% of you picked cooking and baking with these ingredients, but 60% said that and reading labels and avoiding contamination. Um, and I tend to agree with all of you. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I appreciate everybody making the time. So today we're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, and, I, you know, when I see people in person, I like to do demos. And so some of what I've prepared for you today is a little bit of a virtual demo, um, including some favorite recipes from my latest book, The Allergy-Free Pantry. Um, 
but also sort of just in time for summer as picnic season is coming up and you're concerned about what am I going to bring? You know, is, is my son going to be able to eat anything at that potluck or, or whatever? But no matter what we're eating, um, we have to start by finding the right products. And so I always like to start by talking about reading labels because this is one of the real gotchas um, in terms of avoiding food allergies. And it just keeps getting more and more complicated. Um, those of you who've been managing food allergies for a long time know that the Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act um, states that the top eight food allergens must be clearly listed on ingredient labels. Um, and that's great if you're only allergic to those particular foods. Um, for everybody else who has some other allergy out there, a little bit more work is required to dig in and make sure that the foods you're picking are safe. And then, of course, those advisory labels, like in the red um, example you see on the right, where it, there's an advisory label that says made in a dedicated nut and gluten-free bakery, that's great if they're there um, and they provide some additional information, but those are completely optional. There is no legal requirement for that to be listed there any more than there is a legal requirement to say that it was made in a facility that also processes nuts or tree nuts or whatever else they're processing in that facility. So you always have to read the detailed ingredients label. But I do want to spend a minute on the new gluten-free labeling law that went into effect about a year ago because this is kind of a gotcha for those of us with food allergies as well. Um, the gluten-free labeling law is now part of the Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act, but it's the opposite of, it, it states that what's required is almost the opposite of what the existing um, food allergen law um, requires. It, all it does is defines when a product can use the term gluten-free on product packaging. So you see the King Arthur box to the right with a big gluten-free label across the front. Essentially, the law says what needs to happen so that you can actually put that label somewhere on the package. And to define what that is, it just means it's either inherently gluten-free, it doesn't contain a gluten-containing grain, so that would be wheat, barley, or rye, or it has been processed to be less than 20 parts per million of gluten. And that is really, really important because food scientists are now working on ways to take the gluten out of wheat. So until recently, it was pretty safe. If you found a gluten-free product, you would know that it was also wheat-free. In the future, that may not be the case. You will still need to screen for wheat if wheat is on your list of food allergies. Um, to make sure that a gluten-free product is really safe for you. And then going to the next slide, um, oh, but just one more quick thing before we do that. Sorry, Linda. Um, it, we can stay here. And that is that there is no requirement that gluten actually be called out on a product label. So again, it's the opposite of the Food Allergen Labeling Consumer and Protection Act. So now I just want to talk about a couple of examples of labels um, just to sort of um, bring the point home. In the first one, um, you see the Earth Balance vegan shortening on the left. This is a good example of a product where the labels have changed over time. Both the ingredients and the labels have changed. Um, on the right, you can see the ingredients as they now exist in that particular product. Um, but a couple of years ago, they added flax, which wasn't initially there. And so you might have been perfectly okay using this product, and then suddenly there's an ingredient that pops up. And, th and when that popped up, you saw the same packaging as you did before. So you have to read the labels every single time. And now they've actually changed. It used to be called Earth Balance Natural Shortening, and it's now called Earth Balance Vegan Shortening. Um, I think that's primarily because natural, the, the use of the word natural is getting questioned in the marketplace, so they wanted to get ahead of that curve. Um, but again, the label on the package changed, but the ingredients didn't change as they did that. 
This example in the middle is um, one of my favorite. Um, this was a product that somebody sent to me to review for my blog. And you can see on the side of the box, it says no gluten, no GMOs, no soy, no dairy, no nuts except for coconut, um, and no refined white sugar. But on the ingredient list, underlined, you can see that it says organic dried milk powder. So I looked at this, and when they sent it to me, they had said it was dairy-free, and I called them and I said, so which is it? Does it really contain organic dried milk powder, or is it really dairy-free? As it turns out, the ingredient list was correct. Um, and so this is a really good example of how you can't just read um, what's on the front of the box or the side of the box. You really have to look at the detailed ingredients. And if you came across a product like this, I would definitely say call them and check, or just leave it on the shelf and walk away if milk is one of your allergies. I always like to look for products that have the fewest ingredients possible. So I love this example. Um, this is actually Erewhon um, corn flakes, and all that's included is organic milk corn in sea salt. It doesn't get much better than that in terms of finding single ingredient products. So now let's move to the next slide and we'll start talking about some of the some of the issues that many of us have problems with. And I should note at this point that you'll see some visuals of some specific products um, and I will mention product names. I do that because it's helpful for you in terms of finding these things when you go to the grocery store or searching for the right products that might work for you. Um, these are certainly not the only ones that are options, um, but I do want to make sure that you know that I'm not compensated by any of these companies to promote their products. I, I mention them because they're what works for me and may work for you as well. So replacing milk is actually one of the easiest things that you can do um, in terms of replacing food allergies because it's a simple cup for cup or one for one replacement. So if you need to transform a recipe that had one cup of, cup of cow's milk in it, you could replace that with one cup of your favorite non-dairy milk, whether that's rice, hemp, coconut, sunflower, Soy if you're not allergic to it, almond if you're not allergic to it, oat if you're not allergic to wheat or gluten. Um, I still have yet to find a gluten-free oat milk on the market. Um, but any of these you could make yourself, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but there are some, some nice things about these milks. Um, you don't have to refrigerate them until they're open. They stay on, in these shelf stable, in these containers, in your pantry for many, many months. Um, and, and some of these companies are now also making other milk-related products. I especially like So Delicious's Coconut Milk Creamer. That's actually a product that they used to sort of replace the cream that you would put in your coffee. Um, and it works great for that purpose, but it also works really great for some baking applications where you need something just a little bit thicker than milk. Um, there are non-dairy non um, ice creams on the market now. And I should point out that even though coconut is labeled or considered by the FDA as a tree nut, um, and if you are allergic to tree nuts or someone in your family is, make sure you check with your doctor in terms of their guidance on this. But if you are allergic to other tree nuts, it does not necessarily mean that you are also allergic to coconut. So the coconut, for the so delicious coconut milk products, for example, do say contains um, tree nuts or or coconut um, because the FDA requires them to say that. Um, but it still may be okay for you. So that's something to check out if that's an option for you. But you also have the option to make your own milk. And if we move to the next slide, Linda, there we go. Um, making non-dairy milk is actually one of the, one of the simplest things you can do. Um, and in general, um, you'll hear me talk a, a lot during this presentation about making your own. And that is actually in response to a lot of people having difficulty finding products off the shelf that um, really work for them. But if you start with the whole seeds or grains, so this works with rice, um, hemp seeds, or they're referred to as hemp hearts, 
sunflower seeds, oats, um, all work really well um, to be able to make your own non-dairy milk. And you use basically a half a cup of seeds or grains to three cups of water. And you can vary that a little bit if you find that it works better for you. You soak the seeds overnight. I just put them right in the container for um, my blender. Um, when you get up in the morning, you puree them. And then really you can, in most cases, you can use them on strain. The one case I would say don't do that is with rice or oats. It's a little bit too grainy if you don't strain it. But with hemp or sunflower seeds, it's actually really great for you to just leave the seeds in there because um, then you get all of the nutrition of those seeds um, in addition to having made your own milk. But if you want to strain it, you just put like a cheesecloth over um, a strainer, strain it right into the bowl, and then you just kind of pick it up and work the milk out of that cheesecloth. Um, and it gives you like, it gives you a really great option. And then you also have the option to add um, vanilla or um, make a sweetened version um, or even a chocolate version of milk if that's what you prefer. Um, so I recommend um, one and a half teaspoons of vanilla extract if you want a vanilla version or one tablespoon of sugar um, with this three cups of milk is roughly equivalent to what you would find in the sweetened milks that you get off the shelf. So there's, um, and, and those non-dairy milks can be used on your cereal, they can be used in baking, um, anytime you would be um, looking for a non-dairy milk. And once you've made it, um, refrigerate it. So butter and oils um, are a little bit more complicated, um, but they're also an easy replacement in terms of avoiding food allergens. It's again, it's a one-for-one -one replacement. So one tablespoon of non-dairy shortening is equal to one tablespoon of butter. A quarter cup of oil is equal to a quarter cup of any other oil. Um, so oils are very easily substituted for each other and this is probably the simplest substitution because you can you can get a single um, oil um, replacement. So if a recipe calls for sunflower oil and you're allergic to sunflower seeds, you can go ahead and use grapeseed oil and you'll have no problem with that. Shortening is a little bit more complicated because most of them tend to be multi-oil products. So um, depending on your allergist, uh, your allergist may or may not suggest that you need to avoid the oils for the foods that you're also allergic to. Soybean is a, a good example of this. Um, some allergists will say that it's okay to have soybean oil even if you're allergic to soy. In my case, both my son and I are okay with the soybean oil, but, but allergic to soy. Um, but more frequently, allergists are recommending that you avoid them. So you want to look for a product that doesn't contain any of the oils that you are allergic to. I am especially partial to the earth balance shortenings. I think they work really well. That earth balance vegan shortening that we were talking about before is actually one of my favorite, but it does contain soybean oil and it contains flaxseed oil. Um, they've now come out with the earth balance soy free buttery sticks, which are also a really great option and it's completely soy free and completely top eight allergen free at this point. Another option to use. Um, and this is a good one, especially if you do have allergies to certain oils, is coconut oil, um, because it is a single oil product. But because it remains solid at room temperature, it can be used to replace butter, especially in a baking application. So it works well if you're trying to cream it with sugar or work it into a recipe for cookies or pie crust. Um, and Spectrum Organics Natural Shortening is another one I like to mention because that is also a single oil. It's simply palm fruit oil. Um, of all of them, that's the only one I would recommend never putting in the refrigerator. Always use that one at room temperature, even if the recipe says to use the shortening chilled. Um, a lot of margarines um, do contain dairy, so I would, if you're inclined to go with a margarine, um, make sure you read the labels and pick one that's safe for you. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. 
and talk about replacing wheat. I think this is one of the toughest things uh, for people with food allergies or even just those who are gluten-free um, because it's not as simple as just replacing a cup of gluten-free flour with a, a cup of wheat flour with gluten-free flour. Um, there are certain flours that I like to think of as base flours, and those include both of the rice flours, wh white rice and brown rice, as well as sorghum and millet. Those work well as the basis for a gluten-free or and wheat-free flour blend, and they can be substituted for each other. So if you happen to be one of the folks who are allergic to rice, um, try replacing in, in the recipes that you have that call for rice flours, try replacing them with sorghum and or millet. Um, but a very, very important point is to always replace by weight, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. There are lots of other flours that you can use. In fact, there's a whole world of um, wheat-free flours out there, including buckwheat, amaranth, oat corn, teff, quinoa, bean flours. These tend to have more of a bold flavor. And what I find is people either love them or they hate them. And But they're good to add into your repertoire, especially if you're creating your own flour blends, um, and to have some variety every now and then. A couple flours I want to mention specifically are sweet rice and potato. Sweet rice is actually sometimes referred to as glutinous rice, even though it, there's a, there is no gluten in it whatsoever. But it tends to have a starchier um, consistency to it. So sweet rice flours work really well when you add them into flour blends for things like pizza dough or pastry or cookies. Potato flour, not to be confused with potato starch, potato flour um, can be really helpful uh, when you're making certain types of breads, especially things like hamburger buns or hot dog buns or rolls. Um, potato flour tends to really suck up liquid, and so when you add a, even just a little bit of potato flour to a flour blend, it has the effect of um, making it much more pliable. Um, and so something that you want to form into a shape is it's good to add some potato flour into that. Starches, including tapioca, arrowroot, corn, and potato are all relatively substitutable for each other, um, but they are empty calories. And so I like to use as little starch as possible in my flour blends. So a, a flour blend basically needs at least one base flour, at least one starch, and a small amount of gum. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that um, on the next slide. But if you are substituting for wheat flour, if you have a favorite recipe um, that you used to make all the time and it calls for wheat flour, note that wheat flour is much lighter than most gluten-free flour blends. Um, so it's really, really important that you substitute by weight to be able to get the right result. Most wheat flours weigh about 124 grams per cup. Gluten-free flours tend to weigh, can weigh as much as 160 grams per cup. And if you substituted that cup for cup, what will happen is you'll really have like a rock hard result or you'll finish it and you'll say, oh, I need to add more liquid the next time. But that's actually the wrong answer. The right answer is to use less flour. So in some cases, you'll be using two thirds of a cup when you used to use a cup. So let's go to the next slide and talk about weighing those flowers because I know that um, this can be really intimidating, um, but it's one of the simplest things you can do. And once you've weighed your flowers, um, I would venture to guess that you'll never go back to doing it any other way because it just makes the job so much more effective and the results so much more consistent. So what you may or may not really be able to see in this little demo on the bottom is I, you know, I have a scale. Um, it's just a, just a very simple scale. You place a bowl on it, you hit a button, and you zero out the weight of that bowl. Then you pour your flour in to the weight that your recipe requires. You zero it out again. You pour your next flour in to the weight that your recipe requires for that second flour. And you just keep repeating that for each flour or starch that you need to add. Um, I like to use just as much starch as I need. 
So for my muffins and cakes, I use only 20% in my flour blend. For bread, a little bit more. And on the far end of the side, for me, I go up to about 40% for cookies, pastries, pie crust anything that you want to have a little bit flakier. But some, most off-the-shelf flour blends tend to be almost 50% or more starch. So that's something to keep in mind. And I also like to use only as much gum as I need. Um, Dantham gum, I tend to use a quarter teaspoon per cup of flour or partial cup of flour. So if I we're making a recipe that you called for a cup and a half of gluten-free flour, I would use half a teaspoon of xanthan gum. If I was using guar gum, I would double that amount. So that's how to create your own flour blend. And I'm going to move on to eggs. I know from some of the questions that we got prior to this event, the people who wrote in their questions ahead of time, a lot of people were concerned about replacing eggs. And for good reason, because eggs are, um, eggs are unique. Um, there is no egg substitute that provides all of the same properties as an egg. Uh, but there are a number of different things that you can use for different purposes. One of my favorites is what I call flaxseed eggs. And that's actually what you see in the visual here on the left. You take one tablespoon of ground flaxseed meal. I like to grind my own from uh, using golden flaxseeds, but you can use brown flaxseeds. Um, brown flaxseeds will just give you a little bit of, you'll see little specks of, of darkness in your baked goods. Um, or you can just buy flaxseed meal um, at the grocery store um, I like to grind my own because flaxseed meal tends to go rancid fairly quickly. Um, so it's hard to use up a whole bag of flaxseed meal before it will go bad. But you combine one tablespoon of ground flaxseed meal with three tablespoons of warm water. And that's the equivalent of one egg if you were replacing it. And you whisk it together, you let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then you whisk the water back into it. And, and you actually will end up with something that is about the same consistency as an egg prior to baking. Um, and that's really great for texture and taste. You can do the same thing with chia seeds, uh, but you would use only half of a tablespoon of chia seeds because they tend to be even gloppier. Applesauce or any other fruit puree uh, tends to work well in a baking application when you're making things like muffins or cakes. Um, something that has a, a relatively loose batter is when I would choose an applesauce or a fruit puree. Um, the replacement there is a quarter cup per egg. Um, uh, most recipes that call for fruit puree typically call for applesauce because it's very mild. Um, but you can use any other fruit puree that works if you're allergic to apples. So you can do a pear puree, mango puree, but these will have a, a little bit of a flavor. So they'll add some flavor to your baked goods. And uh, mashed banana works well here also, or even um, mashed avocado um, can be used as in place of a fruit puree. Some of you are probably familiar with um, the packaged egg replacers. These are things like energy egg replacer. These are essentially very heavy duty baking powders. Um, so they add um, leavening and they tend to work best in applications where you actually need some lift. Um, so things like breads um, is where I would tend to choose the packaged egg replacer. But frankly, most of the time now, I, I don't reach for the packaged egg replacer. I'll have a tendency to go with flaxseed eggs and maybe just add a little bit more baking powder to the recipe if it's something that I'm adapting. So the important things to remember is to try to pick the right egg replacer for, for the application that you're using. Um, and a little bit of um, experimenting is, um, is the best thing that you can do there. So let's move on to the next slide. And we'll talk about some of the things that we can do with my favorite flaxseed eggs. Um, so 
um, people who are allergic to eggs and allergic to soy have very limited options in terms of having a mayonnaise. Um, and this is for whether or not you want it for a sandwich topping to mix in with your potato salad or your pasta salad. Um, you know, any of those salads you might be wanting to bring to the picnic this summer. You can actually make a mayonnaise using flaxseed eggs. So you make the flaxseed eggs the way we just talked about. Um, I like to add a little bit of salt, a little bit of mustard, a little bit of lemon juice, but those are actually not, those are optional ingredients. If you're allergic to mustard, you can leave the mustard out or you could substitute it with different flavors. Um, so two flaxseed oils and three quarters of a cup of oil. And what you can see in the visual on the bottom is done with uh, an immersion blender. And that's the best tool for this particular um, recipe because you want a blade that fits really low so that you can make sure you catch. Because what we're doing here is we're, we're um, making an emulsion. And so what we're doing is we're combining ingredients that wouldn't normally combine on their own. So you need a really, really high speed um, to be able to do that. Um, so you combine the flaxseed eggs, um, the salt, the mustard, the lemon juice if you're using them, and you just pulse a couple times um, with the immersion blender. The trick here is to add the oil really slowly until it starts to thicken. And so you add a few drops of oil while continuously running the blender. Um, once it starts to thicken, you can add that oil in a little bit faster. Um, you move the immersion blender up and down um, to make sure everything gets incorporated. And then um, you've got uh, a, a really nice mayonnaise that can be used, like I said, you know, with your salads. Um, with your salad dressings as a sandwich topping. And I've recently discovered that you can do the same thing using um, what is known as aquafaba or bean brine. So another alternative um, in terms of um, an egg replacer, if you will, is the, the liquid that is in a can of beans. And this works best with garbanzo beans. Um, but normally you would just like drain that li liquid down the sink, or at least that's what I used to do. Um, now I never throw it away because I can use that um, liquid from the can of beans instead of the flaxseed eggs um, to, to make a really nice light mayonnaise. Um, so that's something for you all to try out. And also, I'm not really going into it here, but you can use that same bean brine um, to make meringues. Up until recently, I used to tell people that with these egg replacers, you could pretty much make anything that wasn't specifically egg-based. So I would tell people you can't make omelets, you can't make eggs over easy, you can't make meringues. Um, but now we can um, using... Um, Aquafaba. Um, so that's a really cool thing. And there's actually a post on the um, Kids with Food Allergies website about that as well as mine. Salad dressing. Um, this is probably one of the most frustrating things for people with food allergies because you go into the salad dressing aisle and there are 300 or more bottles of salad dressing and you have to read all those labels to find one that works for you. But salad dressing is one of the simplest things to make at home. And I will never buy a packaged bottle or processed bottle of salad dressing ever again. Here's just an example of three ingredients you could combine. But essentially, you can take any oil, any vinegar or acid, including like lemon juice, um, and any sweetener if you want a sweetener. Um, you put them together in a small bottle. Um, Keep those bottles that, that keep those jars that um, honey comes in and reuse them for this purpose. They're actually perfect for salad dressing. Um, you just pour everything into a jar, put the lid back on, shake it all up, um, and you can use that um, to dress your salad. You can add any spices, herbs, fruits, mustard. You can make honey mustard salad dressing using the same thing. You can make a creamy ranch. Um, or what I call a mock Caesar um, by adding a flaxseed mayonnaise or an aquafaba mayonnaise. Um, so you've got endless numbers of ways that you can make salad dressing at home and avoid having to go to the grocery store and read all those labels. 
Mustard is another simple example of something that you can make at home. Um, the required ingredients for making mustard, you really do need mustard seeds. So if you're allergic to mustard, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a solution for you there. Um, but you combine the mustard seeds with some sort of vinegar. I like to use brown rice vinegar for what, what you would typically think of as a plain yellow mustard, um, as well as some water. And you, you soak the seeds and the vinegar um, at least overnight, but you can actually soak them uh, um, two or three days in advance. Um, you add spices, whatever spices you want. Here I put in salt, pepper, and a little bit of turmeric. Um, and then when you're ready, you add a little bit more water um, and you use the immersion blender to just blend it up into a nice creamy mayonnaise. You can make the mayonnaise as creamy or as thick as you like, um, just simply by adding more water. Um, adding more water will make it more of a consistency of like those mayonnaises you used to squeeze out of the squirt bottles that you might not be able to use anymore. Um, any vinegar or acid can be used. You can make a version uh, that is more like a um, uh, more like a gray poupon kind of version by um, using white wine vinegar if you're not allergic to sulfites um, and um, some brown mustard seeds. So you've got a lot of flexibility here in terms of what you can do to make a mustard. One of my favorite things to do um, is making sunflower seed butter. But sunflower seeds in general are a great replacement if you are allergic to nuts. Um, sunflower seeds can be um, it can be simply roasted. Um, you just lay them out on a flat baking sheet covered with parchment paper and you bake them at 325 degrees for about 10 to 15 minutes. And you know when they're done because they get a little bit golden and you can smell them. Um, so that's when they're done. Um, but to make sunflower seed butter, you start with a cup of roasted sunflower seeds. You add some salt. Um, you have the option to add sugar or not, depending on how sweet you want it. Um, up to two tablespoons of oil, you can go even a little bit more than that if you want to make it a little bit creamier. But basically you pulse, you let it sit for a little bit, you, you um, scrape down the edges of the bowl, you pulse some more, you let it sit. You do that three or four times um, until you get to the consistency you want. Um, and this is great as a replacement for peanut butter to put on celery sticks for a great summer snack. Other uses for sunflower seeds, um, I like to add them if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're the type that really liked nuts in your chocolate chip cookies or nuts in your brownies, sun, cracked sunflower seeds. So um, what I mean by that is you would just um, pulse a few times in a small food processor to just you know, break them into semi-big chunks. Um, but not, but don't use them whole as a replacement for seeds. Definitely chop them up a bit. Um, so sunflower seed butter um, is great for summertime um, sandwiches, lunches, snacks. And now, breaded anything, um, and that's whether you're talking like breaded chicken tenders, eggplant, anything that you you're sort of missing that breaded coating for fish if you can have it. Um, there are lots of different ways to make uh, allergen-free breadcrumbs, but one of my favorite ways is to just use a cereal. This is that same cereal I was talking about earlier when we looked at the food at the um, ingredients label that contains only organic milled corn and sea salt. Um, so um, it's very safe for most of us, unless you're allergic to corn. Um, another way you can make breadcrumbs is simply by toasting and then um, in, a, in a food processor um, pulsing to um, crush it to make breadcrumbs. Um, never throw away any of the um, edges of the breads that you use. Always keep those and ultimately you'll use them to make breadcrumbs. But in this case, you would coat the meat or the protein or whatever it is you're breading with any safe flour. You don't have to use a flour blend for this one. You can use just the plain brown rice flour or whatever you happen to have on hand. Um, I like to do it with a flour as opposed to a starch, but typically you can use either one. 
Um, you can add salt and pepper to that if you'd like. Um, so you dredge the, let's call it chicken, um, in this flour. Um, you dip it into flaxseed eggs. So that's what's going to create your moist layer. If you are allergic to flax, um, you're, you can create that moist layer with whatever milk is safe for you. And then you roll it in the breadcrumbs and bake depending on what you're making. If I'm making chicken tenders, I will typically bake them at 350 for about 25 minutes, depending on how th the thick the chicken is. But you would bake them until they're done, essentially. Um, and again, this works with um, pretty much anything. Uh, so you can make, uh, and if you're going to do it, make a big batch of chicken tenders and freeze them. Because these um, work really, really well once frozen. You can, you can actually heat them up from frozen. So this is great if you're looking for a meal for, you know, that day when you come home and you're frazzled or you just don't feel like cooking anything. So highly encourage you to make a big batch when you do this. And last um, couple things before we get to questions, and I know you're going to have questions, is avoiding contamination. Um, again, this is this is sort of one of the compulsories that we have to talk to. In addition to reading labels, um, make sure that the utensils you're using um, and the tools you're using are safe. I avoid wooden cutting boards because there's just no way to get them clean enough to make sure that you got all those breadcrumbs out. Um, Use separate toasters, separate waffle irons. Cooling racks tend to have little cracks. Anything that has little cracks or dishes with seams where things can get caught. Sponges and dish towels, I think um, this is one we don't necessarily think about enough, but if you just wipe up the counter to get rid of um, the crumbs and the dairy milk, um, now that um, sponge is contaminated. Um, and so you really need to make sure you replace those very frequently. Um, I'm a big believer in paper towels. Um, some of you can argue with me about that if you want, but um, paper towels and dishwasher tend to work really well. That plate that you see on the bottom, that's by a company called Safe and Happy Family. They had sent me a sample of this to review, but the, the point here is simply that um, you know, if you're preparing separate meals, always prepare the special diet meal first. If you do have something like a special plate for the person in your family with food allergies, just you know, be really religious about using it only for that purpose so that you, everybody knows that it's safe. And always remember to follow your doctor's instructions. Um, like I said earlier, you know, check with them on which foods um, for, work for you. Check every ingredient label every single time because the ingredients do change. And if you're not sure, um, leave it on the shelf and choose only the options that work for you. Um, it's great that we have communities like Kids with Food Allergies where we can share ideas, but everybody's specific, unique situations are different. So what's healthy for one person um, might be poison for somebody else. So we need to make sure that we always, always check. So I think we're ready to move to questions. And again, or I don't know if, Linda, you wanted to, um, are, are we picking the... Prizes I think, first. I think I'm going to do some uh, prizes first. Okay. And then we'll do some. Uh, then we'll take some questions. People have been sending me questions. Okay. So we all. have a couple of giveaways. Two prizes each. Uh, Libre Nationals uh, is giving away two $20 e-certificates for use at their website at www.librenaturals.com. It can be used on your grand total, including on any of their gluten-free and allergy-friendly products and shipping. And the two winners for those two $20 e-certificates are Marissa Dubay and Rita Schwartz. And Gina from our office will be contacting you to arrange uh, how to get those to you. The winners of the two Pasha uh, giveaways will each receive a 3.5 ounce bar, one bag of chocolate chips, and one bag of the new mini bars. And the winners of those are Maria Angelov and Sandra Lozano. And again, you can expect to receive an email from Gina at our Doylestown headquarters. And the winners of our Sun Butter giveaway uh, will receive six jars each of delicious Sun Butter uh, uh, 
um, uh, tasty treats. And the winners of that will be Nicole Foster and Trudy Osmond. So you'll be stocked for sandwiches for the uh, upcoming summer and possibly into September, depending on how much you eat. So now we can move on to the questions that we've received. Um, some of them are on the slides and some of them I'm just going to read after we get through the slides. So Linda, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, how can I make bread when I can't use yeast, rice, corn, or wheat? So um, bread, if you can't use yeast, um, you will obviously not be making a yeast bread. Um, you ca what you can do is you can make essentially what is a quick bread. Um, so you would use, um, you can use a product like a, uh, a pancake and baking mix type of product, the kind that you would use to make like biscuits, um, uh, to make something like a quick bread. Um, but if you can't use, this one's very specific, if you can't use rice, um, or we, you, it'll be unlikely that you'll be able to find a product off the shelf. So what I would recommend in that scenario is to create your own flour blend. Um, depending on what else you can use, I would maybe use a combination of sorghum and millet with, with probably some tapioca starch and some potato starch um, and make a quick bread version or essentially an unsweetened um, quick bread. Um, and use that for a for a bread. Um, the other uh, the other thing that might suit you better too is to do something more like rolls, um, something biscuit like or hamburger bun like or um, in I, I'm, I'm not so much trying to promote my own books here as much as to just give you options. But in learning to bake allergen free, I have a sweet potato roll. Um, recipe that actually is really great to use for like making sandwiches because you can slice them and you know add whatever you want in between. So that's what I would look for in that particular case. Colette, can you define what is a quick bread for people who are unfamiliar with that term? So a quick bread is just um, essentially a non-yeast bread. Um, it may or may not contain sugar depending on what it is, but quick breads usually are made with muffin mixes or biscuit mixes. Um, you would use a biscuit mix for something that's more savory, and you would, you would use a muffin mix for something that's more sweet. Okay. Right. But because this particular person seems to have a very unique case, um, you know, if they want to send back another email later and ask more detail about that, I'll, tr I'll try to help them. <laughs> okay. And what is the question on the next slide? How do you know which is the best egg substitute to use in a particular recipe? Well, we, we talked about this a little bit um, in terms of the options that are available for eggs. I would tend to use applesauce or a fruit puree if I'm making muffins, quick breads, or um, cakes or cupcakes, things like that. Um, I would tend to use something like flaxseed eggs if I am making bread, um, pizza crust, um, pastries, I would have a tendency to use a fruit puree. Um, so it, it, it does depend on the application um, and really the composition. Um, but if you're using a box mix off the shelf and you're trying to, and it calls for um, two eggs, um, you're probably good with being able to use an egg substitute there, but I would tell you to be wary of any box mix that requires four or more eggs, especially if it has a high sugar content. Those will not work well with any egg replacer. And the best example I have there is brownies. It's really hard to find um, brownies that work without eggs um, because typically they have a much higher sugar content and when the sugar content is really high and you don't have the eggs in there, um, you're going to end up with essentially a burnt mess. Hmm. Someone asked us a question a few minutes ago that their boxed mix using applesauce as an egg replacer fell apart. Um, it was, uh, it had wheat but it was dairy free. So could that be that it called for too many eggs and maybe there was too much fruit puree in it? 
it could be that it called for too many eggs or it was a box mix that had too much sugar content. But I will, I will say something else about just in general, the, this, this applies to the gluten-free flour blends off the shelf as well as the box mixes off the shelf. There is a lot of variance in these products. Um, some of them perform dramatically better than others. And I hate to say this because I know that food allergy foods are so expensive, so we tend to want to buy the one that is cheaper. But this really is a case of you get what you pay for. The flowers are not all the same. Um, and so I, I will mention so that it will be helpful to the audience that I find the King Arthur flower mixes as an example to perform really, really well and really consistently, um, except for the brownie mix. If you if you need to replace the eggs, hmm. um, so those are actually my favorite. Okay, next question on the next slide. How can I substitute for soy in a recipe? Um, well, if it's soy flour, you would replace the flour um, by weight with one of the other options that's safe for you. If we're talking about um, tofu. Um, I don't have a really good answer there, although I have seen that um, Living Harvest is coming out with a hemp-based tofu-like product, which I'm really, really excited to try. Um, so that might be an option there. Soy sauce um, is an issue. I actually, a couple of years ago at, a, at an event where um, Sanjay, the folks who make soy sauce, were sponsoring the author booth, and I went over to thank them for doing that, and I said, by the way, you don't happen to have a soy-free soy sauce, do you? And they kind of laughed at me. Um, <laughs> so the answer is, <laughs> there really is no soy-free soy sauce. Um, I would have a tendency to avoid, um, you know, to either, either leave the soy sauce out or, you know, it's, uh, tend to, um, you know, replace it with other flavors. Um, but it's it's really hard um, without knowing exactly which kind of soy they were talking about. Okay. Tree nuts or peanuts? Um, often my answer to tree nuts or peanuts in a recipe is to leave them out. If it's um, something like a granola, I would have a tendency to maybe replace it with sunflower seeds. We talked about using you know chopped sunflower seeds to replace nuts in um, something like a cookie or a brownie recipe. Um, that works really well. It also works really well if you're trying to make sort of like a nutty topping. Um, so, um, for uh, a recipe like um, uh, that requires pine nuts, for example, um, I would have a tendency to replace that with something like hemp seeds, which has a little bit of a nutty taste. So if you were making a pesto, my version of pesto uses um, hemp seeds instead of uh, pine nuts. Okay. Um, someone asked, can you store flaxseed in the freezer to keep it from going, getting rancid? Yes. In fact, I highly recommend you doing that. Um, I, I would leave only what you're actually you know, using in the next few weeks in the refrigerator, but absolutely store it in the freezer. That will extend the shelf life. And by the way, you can do the same thing with um, any of your gums. Gums tend to go, xanthan gum, guar gum tend to go bad very quickly. When I buy a package of xanthan gum, I put it in two separate containers. One of them goes in the freezer and the other one goes in the refrigerator. Um, and that way it lasts a lot longer. Because even though it's a really small container, you use so little of it that it has a, a high possibility of going bad before you get to it. Uh, one of our attendees today said their child is allergic to xanthan gum. So is guar gum interchangeable with xanthan gum? I, yes, um, but I would double the amount. So if a recipe calls for half a cup of xanthan gum, you, I'm sorry, not half a cup, half a teaspoon <laughs> of xanthan gum. Use one teaspoon of guar gum. And do you have any experience with Montina flour? That's another exotic flour. But I have not tried Montina flour. Yeah, it's another gluten-free one that someone asked. Yeah, there's about. actually a whole bunch of them coming out. I, I actually have 
in my pantry to try some banana flour. Really? Um, and there are all kinds of all kinds of different flowers coming out now. Um, one thing I will say, because I didn't talk about it earlier, um, and I don't typically with this audience, but you will find recipes out there made with like almond flour. Um, right. That does not substitute in the same ways as the other flours do. So if you're if you're tempted to use almond flour, um, it, it will soak up a lot more liquid. So you'll tend to need to use a lot more liquid with those flours. Okay. Um, I think we can start to wrap up. Um, I just want to leave everyone with an important message about anaphylaxis from our spring coming. If you're in the or audit, I'm sure that they're not going to expire while you're away. Always take two wherever you go. Um, you may even want to take more if you're going on vacation. And make sure that you're going to keep them shielded from hot summer temperatures or cold if you're going somewhere else. And you can learn more at our website at the handout anaphylaxis, severe allergic reactions. And please join us for our next webinar with pediatric allergist Dr. Irene McHale from Nationwide Children's in Columbus, Ohio. She's going to talk about oral food challenges and what to expect. That's July 28th at 1 p.m., so please join us for that. And if you're looking for more tips and ideas on cooking, you can visit our forums, community.kidswithfoodallergies.org slash forums. You can find out about some of the new food finds that Colette mentioned uh, at our blog. We talk about them, um, the living foods, I think you said living harvest, hemp soy alternative that'll, that's coming out. I think that's coming out next year, actually. We plan on writing about that. We post food recalls and more on our blog, and we have a recipe collection, and you can upload your own favorite uh, family recipe to our website at kidswithfoodallergies.org. So please check that out as well. And once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank Colette for joining us. Thank you for being with us here during our 10th anniversary year. If you like these presentations, please consider making a donation by going to our website and clicking the big green donate button. Thank you again and see you next month. And look for the uh, email, uh, including the archive of this webinar sometime in the next couple of days. Thank you. <laughs>